you are now live. Okay, so let's let's run the. Uh, let's see, um, Is that a shareable link? Action the. Uh, yeah, that is correct. We're gonna put the uh, the PowerPoint into play. Okay, so this is where we are at. Uh, loss and grief. Uh, the uh, title of this lecture: uh, Transcendency. Uh, looking at how does one uh, maintain one's being, who one is, and the role that you're assigned, and how you become. So it's about being and becoming, and how do you how do you do that? In our loss and grief protocols, we talked about the importance of practicing, and a form of practicing we talk about is ascesis. And how that uh, helps you to acquire the wisdom and knowledge in order to, uh, to, to modify and to create a, a transcendent self with transactional agency that allows you to play certain roles within the beloved community. A uh, wonderful term, beloved community. Um, basically, um, being part of a community is very important. Having that connectivity with other people is very important. You know, um, most of us, you know, I, I've been using this metaphor of being on the Titanic all week long in my own private practice. And it's the idea that, you know, you can accommodate to life even on the decks of the Titanic if you have intimacy in that space. And so what you have to do is try to create an intimate space for yourself in that, that space in the Titanic. Um, so uh, a lot of times when, when your routines are disrupted in that space, you act out. You have a lot of problems you're acting out. There are other things that are happening there that become somewhat problematic. So again, this lecture is lecture six on loss and grief. This is based on the Venn diagram on loss and grief. And um, we're looking at transcendency, which is uh, a very important uh, uh, component. And we talk about the tripartite self. Uh, as Kierkegaard and others have talked about it, we talk about aesthetics. How does one establish oneself? Uh, and how does one... Uh, communicate with the world, and how does one make oneself uh, be effective where you are in the world. And uh, our entire program is, has to do with loss and grief, how do you manage loss and grief, and how do you um, use yourself as a tool in that process. So transcendency is one of the tripartite components of one's identity. You know, we talked about aesthetics. We talk about moral development and we talk about transcendency. Transcendency becomes very important because of what it subserves. Transcendency in our program talks about security, safety, support, and service. Because it doesn't matter what you do, it's a, it matters how what your routines and habits are in, in the beloved community. Um, so um, we we talk about some of the relevant questions that we're going to try to answer in this presentation. We talk about what are the two types of anxieties. We talk about uh, process turns and, and, and depressive anxiety. We talk about the importance of power in our relationships. You know, four cults, among others, have talked about the importance of power and power dynamics, how we define ourselves in relationship with each other. It's very important in how we manage our anxieties. We talk about power unto death. What is that? Power unto death. That's kind of Hegel, Hegelian understanding of our conscious development and, and it's a very important part in all of our lives. It's the way we begin to understand power relationships and how we can do, utilize power in, in, our, in, in our relationship with all human beings. Um, the, we talk about the importance of relationships. Uh, relationships are very important in managing those intimate spaces, creating those intimate spaces, and it's how we recover from loss. Um, how is Practicing related to ascesis or denial of self. You know, one of the books that I'm referencing at this is for, for this, this uh, book that I'm trying to put together. It's called uh, it's a book on, by Foucault. It's called Foucault's Ascesis. And uh, Foucault stated that one has to deny oneself in order to facilitate the work in the community, to make the, the community much more. Um, user friendly, much more of an intimate space. You know, if every time we get into a situation with someone, we talk about our rights, what is what we are what we need, we run into real problems because nothing ever gets done that way. If you always talk about your loss, your hurt, your pain, whatever. So being able to uh, be so much in control of your own faculty that you're able to develop this 
focus on yourself. This preoccupation with yourself is very important. Um, so the other thing we talk about is that power is very, very fragile. God's power is very strong. And people get confused about forces of nature, such as storms and earthquakes, and we kind of personify that and say, well, that is God's power. Now, that's power of creation. That's not God's power. power God's power is not destructive. And so we tend to project that kind of power onto human power. So we think the atomic bomb is like God's power. No, it's not. It, it's, a, it's a misunderstanding of God's power. God's power is with love and, and creation. And so we, we, we tend to use power in a very destructive way when we talk about each other. God's power is about love. There's nothing destructive about that. There's no fear involved in it? No fear. Love is love, man. Love is a wonderful thing. But yet, human beings, when we talk about it, it's part of what we talk about. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about our discursive nominalization, naming things, that we run into problems in our limited understanding of what power is. But power is very fragile. Power is in the relationship we have with each other. Now, um, we talk about also the beloved community, how we define the beloved community, what is the beloved community. But the beloved community, I think, is fundamental for how we, each one of us recover from loss. I'm always amazed at what's happening, for example, in, in Louisiana right now. You mean and the The, flood? the floods. Mm -hmm. And look at how the federal government has dealt with that and created, look at uh, access Obama's speech, where he talks about don't, don't deride our, our first responders, don't deride the federal government. We have a role to play. And when you talk about people who are, I, taught, I turn, the, it's revanchist conservatives who want to destroy the power of government. Well, now you're seeing they the want to, they, you see the need for government. The revanchists want to tell you that government has no role, nothing. Well, it's anti-Hegelian. Hegel tells you that the most important historical entity is the state. Oh, it, it, we have some problems there back and forth. You know, it's a very controversial point. But I, I, I tend to be a neo-Hegelian. I believe that the state is very important in, in, in establishing yeah, rights, yeah. rights for human beings, mm -hmm. responsibilities for human beings responsibility of the government, over the government, and so forth and so on. So it's very, very important. Um, how, is, how is practicing and ascesis re, uh, related to, to choice and free will? This is one of those universal recurring questions that's been thousands of years. People have been playing with it for thousands and thousands of years, okay? So those are some of the questions we, we frog in. So, so again, one of the things that uh, that is very, very important to our program is this term called discursive nominalization. Discursive nominalization. We talked about it last week. We talked about epic speech. The parrot. Why do you want the parrot? Why do you want the parrot? Human beings engage in this kind of meaningless babbling all of the time and we're trying to give some value and meaning to it. Um, our current political um, our current political Oh, it's your fault. I'm over there. It's okay. It's very annoying. I have to keep this close. It's very, very annoying. Our current, our current political system is is just a wonderful for me laboratory looking at this thing called discursive normalization. We all engage in it. It's the way we try to understand and learn about things. You know, I want to save the world. Well, you want to save the world. How can we help you <laughs> save the world? Well. Uh, I need twenty five dollars because we want to put together things. Well, I don't have twenty five dollars, man, because I don't. We want to save the world, right? Why can't you twenty five dollars? So that's an example of discursive normalization. You know, um, this this whole business about Hillary's email is such nonsense. But yet we spend so much time talking about that. Talking about nothing. We're talking about mm -hmm. nothing. We're talking about the 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 the, uh, the Clinton uh, nonprofit, mm -hmm. which is which is provided relief for thousands and thousands, millions of people, yet we, we, we are engaging in political sausage making in trying to destroy this, this wonderful nonprofit agency. Now look, the president used his name to make money to facilitate what he wanted to do. That's, that's historicism. People do it all the time. He's also mm -hmm. the founder of ISIS. Who said that? <laughs> Thank you. You made my point. That's another example of discursive novelization. It's bullshit. <laughs> you know, it is just and, and people I engage in it in Turkey, though, right? Well, well it, it's in Syria. It's in Syria. Syria. Yeah, it's in Syria. Anyway, discursive novelization is people get make statements to get other they people going, and, that's and you you focus on the emotion, but you don't you don't focus on what it really means. Now, the, 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 
point of this is that this question of dominization is something we all engage in. But, but, but well, we all engage in it. But you know something? At some point, we begin to be influenced by the culture. We begin to be influenced by trying to be authentic and to be responsible. Mm -hmm. We go through what we talked about in terms of anger management communications, which we went from diatribe to discussion to discourse. It is part of our program. We talked about it. You know, a diatribe is, is a discussion of normalization. It's just your loss. It's just about your loss. Oh, oh, uh, oh this man who says that he wants the African American vote, first American, first black American president, he said was a, was a, was a, was a Kenyan, born in Kenya. And he completely used the racial Perfect. dog whistle, dog whistle. And we are, we are, we are taking this man seriously. I mean, this, this, is, this, is, this is wonderful, but it's an example of discursive normalization. It's acquiring knowledge at position one. Again, at position one is the energy schema of paranoid position. The problem with discursive normalization is that it engages in a lot of confirmational bias. It, it, all, of your, all of your prejudices can come forth. Mm -hmm. I'm going to build a wall. The mm -hmm. implicit in that is that, you know, Mexicans are a good part oh, of them are, really? race, are, are rapists. And so this is the kind of confirmational bias that you go forward with and you end up prob having problems with. Now, um, knowledge versus transcendency. At some point, you have to make a choice. Uh, in, 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 because discursive normalization is the pursuit of knowledge. And that is use, use, useful to a certain point, but at some point, you have to go to a place of acceptance. And with acceptance, you can go to a place of transcendency. And transcendency is where you begin to engage others in the beloved community where you are able to support service, security, safety, and support for the entire beloved community to make sure that we have intimacy in five acts. Intimacy in terms of taking care of our family, taking care of our lovers, or uh, taking care of all our brothers and sisters, taking care of the stranger amongst us, taking care of God's creation. Uh, so that becomes very important. So the importance here is that being and becoming becomes very important. Because just, just being, just, just existing is nothing. Just existing, I'm here. When I just exist, I am nothing. Because I am static. You see me in all of my ignominy. 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 Mm -hmm. I am just nothing. It is when you strive to be a good father, a good husband, a good soldier, a good citizen, and you're striving to become. Being and becoming, it's very important. And so that's what is, that is, that is a very important part of that process. Um, so, routines and habits are what we need to support each other and to support ourselves. We talk mm -hmm. about uh, the ship, the, the deck of the Titanic. Mm -hmm. We know the ship is going to sink. But we have to create intimate spaces within that deck in order to survive. Mm -hmm. So the way we create those intimate spaces is by routines and habits, where we accommodate each other to make sure each other has space to thrive and to do well. So routines and habits of ourselves and knowledge becomes very important. A very important part of that process of practicing and giving each other space to become who we are going to become is something we call ascesis. Ascesis is when you diminish what your self needs are to that of the community. Now, in our next lecture, we're going to talk about that process of ascesis, when it's practiced on a subjective or an individual level versus practiced on a, on a, on a societal level. And we reference the, uh, the warrior society of Sparta, where ascesis was practiced and it was imposed by the state. So, as a, it was a warrior culture where men ate with each other, away from women. You know, they were, they were part of a military force, and they had to live in a kind of a regimented existence. The, the, all of the power went to the state, and, and the, the Spartans were a fierce fighting force. In terms of the, ex, uh, the, the exertion of power and force, they were awesome. But the problem with, with that is that you take little kids when they're seven and you regiment their lives in such a way, they end up becoming somewhat cruel. And they, they, they victimize a lot of people in their, in, their, in their community. They kill people for the sport of it. They did a lot of vicious things. And so the, there's this push and pull. Where do we want this 
this uh, this ASCII system lie? Who owns the ASCII? Who owns the self denial? It's best if it's done not on a societal level, but on an individual level. A lot of people within the right wing, and even some of the people on the left, want people to assume as cases, meaning you should sacrifice for the good of the, the, the country, community. the community. But they want only poor people to sacrifice. You know, they only want mm -hmm. poor people to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the idea is that, you know, we, you, we want to be able to create, a, you know, a tax break for the, for the job creators. And so we want them to, you know, not to spend too much money for the water in Flint, Michigan. Because once the car company goes away, you know, we don't need good water. Those people can, they get, can drink they dirty can water. Whatever yeah. water we can provide for them. And we could save enough money from you know, tax breaks in order to take care of the job creators. That is called discursive normalization. It's a, it's a position that's immoral. It's a position that's inauthentic. It doesn't lead to a solution. You end up creating more problems than you, you do solutions. Um, one of the one of the wonderful um, in presenting this in presenting this 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 uh, this lecture, one of the wonderful uh, quotes that I came upon was uh, a quote by Ralph Waldo Emerson, and I think it has a lot to do in terms of describing what the beloved community should look like. I call it intimacy in, in, in five acts. It says that man is a bundle of relationships a knot of roots whose flowers and fruits is the world. Our, our ability to engage with each other creates that space, that intimate space, which, which gives us a chance to thrive and to overcome loss. And so routine and habit becomes very important for that, that purpose. Um, again, language is a very important part of how you create that intimate space. Language is very, very important. We talked about it in previous lectures. We talked about the three types of uh, language speech. We talked about edic speech, idostic speech, and eidetic speech. And each one of those progressions, you go to a more intimate space where you can able, you're able to, 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 to take care of each other. And so that becomes a very important part of this process. Now, um, one of the one of the one of the one of the the people that I really really admired a great deal was David Hume. Didn't understand David Hume for a long long time, and he's a skeptic and he's empiricist. But I I like the guy. I love the guy actually, because you know he doesn't look at what exists and make all sorts of suppositions about that. You know, in Amer the American culture, one of the icons of the American right is uh, a woman by the name of Anne Rand. And she was, she was termed an objectivist. She believed that poor people were poor because of, they were poor because they, 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 they you know, they, they weren't worth anything. It wasn't based on anything other than the fact that, you know, that's their objective. Right. And so, one of the reasons I love a guy like David, who was skeptic, he would be, he would be skeptic of such an assumption. And he says, you know, facts are not really facts. Facts are in support of a position that sometimes is not necessarily true. Mm -hmm. And you have to be very skeptical about things as you see them. Yeah, and so that's one of the things I love about, mm -hmm. about that process. The beloved community is very much necessary for recovery from separation, loss, grief, and sadness. Um, the beloved community defines an intimate space, a holding environment in which you're able to take care of yourself and others. Um, that holding space starts out being external to you. But over a period of time, you in internalize that. It's how, you know, when kids start out speaking, they engage in edit speech, which is just kind of a naive kind of discursive normalization where they're naming things, but it has no real meaning. But as they go forward, intimacy allows one to internalize that, 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 that speech and that space. And you begin to, it begins to inform choices, your choices based on intimacy and, and the needs of the community and, need, and your need to, of being and becoming, being and becoming greater than yourself. Now, moral sentiment and sympathy holds that intimate space together. And it should not be underestimated. One of the things that I love about the Scots, and that's why I'm going to create this lecture series in Scotland, is about the idea of moral sentiment and moral sympathy. 
and how that informs your choices that you make in a societal level. Um, this in, in, in quick review, essential elements in recovery are these. Just to exist is nothing at all. Just to exist is nothing at all. You have to have action in being and becoming. And that is, that is subsumed by, 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 by elaborating a role, an identity for yourself. We all dis uh, engage in what I term discursive nominalization. And a lot of that, that, that kind of speech starts at very not internet. It's edit speech. And a lot of times we, are, we deal with each other and we deal with, with each other. Sometimes we find ourselves in a space with people that are not very intimate. They're making very nasty comments and statements, very destructive. And that's what I term nihilism. And sometimes as a psychiatrist or development psychiatrist, I, I'm not necessarily put off by that because I understand that that is a process by which someone consolidates an identity. You know, I, a lot of times people negate who you are as a person. They're very destructive to you, who you are as a person. Mm -hmm. And one of the people that, of course, I've been referencing is a guy by the name of Arthur Schopenhauer. And uh, he wrote a piece called um, In the World Will and Representation. And he realizes that human beings, when they begin to exert their will, can be very nasty and very destructive. Mm. Okay. Very nasty, very destructive. Yeah. And and so sometimes you're really set off by that that thing. But as you as you as you get into a place where you have to make choices, you have to begin to accept the roles of others. You have to accept the fact that you can't always be looking for some way to leverage certain things. Mm. There has to come a point when you say, you know, Hillary Clinton is a good person. She has good ideas. You have to be kind to her. You want her to be a president. You have to be kind to Barack Obama. He wants to be a president. He has, his mind is in a good place. You don't, you don't completely savage him and level him by saying he's not, a, he's not legitimate. Mm. And engaging in that kind of destructive mm. talk because that has led to some very, very dangerous mm -hmm. positions in this country where people's lives are at risk people and, get and people get, put, get damaged very badly. Right, as, brought, right. So, ascesis is going to be the topic of our next lecture. Is, is is a way of practicing where you do not focus on or become preoccupied with yourself. Some of the more destructive people that I've met are those who are preoccupied with themselves and they perceive hurt, slights, and whatever. And they tend to be very destructive in their engagement in discursion normalization. They set up this. Yes. If you're not going to be preoccupied with yourself, not to interject, then who will be preoccupied with you? I mean, I mean, if, I mean, because think about it, you're saying not to be preoccupied with yourself, but if you're not to come out of yourself, because when you come out of yourself and you, and you don't concentrate on yourself, you're able to well, be a better person. Yeah. You expect somebody else to concentrate on you? When you tend to pre when you when you are preoccupied with yourself, you begin to see everything that's wrong. It's with all yourself. about you. Because when if you put yourself uh, as the center of the universe, mm -hmm. you begin to see all your flaws. Everybody sees your flaws. You see your flaws. They see your flaws. Absolutely. And 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 you don't go anywhere with it. It's about being and becoming. And one of the things that I would like you to think about is this guy uh, Foucault. He wrote a book called Ascesis. And, and he talks about that philosophical process by which, in his term, he became a philosopher, or I became um, a better psychiatrist. It's the idea that you have to give up your preoccupation with yourself and your perceived slights and hurts. You know, um, a, 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 a week or two weeks ago, I talked about the fact that in my workspace, there's a new psychiatrist came in the block and they took away my computer and they gave me the internet. You know? And of course, I was very hurt by that. I said, man, I'm, 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 mm -hmm. I'm Dr. King, man. Why should you do that to me? Don't you know who I am? Yeah. And I thought about it and I thought about it. And I said, you know, I understand why they did what they this is a new kid on the block. They want to make him feel good. Expense. They want they, well, they yeah, my expenses. But but the thing about it is he is now engaged in their teaching program. He is now engaged in, in taking care of, of 
farm their populations. I'm no longer interested in it. Because I've been so so damaged and, 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 and disrespected for so many years that if I, if I get when I become preoccupied with myself, that's what I focus on. And, and it's, whereas this kid has a fresh eye. He is willing to accept roles and positions that I don't necessarily want to accept anymore, but he is. And so sometimes you have to get out of that space and understand that other people have very important roles to play. And you give, you give them a chance to play those roles. Yeah. Um, so that becomes a very important part of that process. Um, we've all been there. We've all been there. We've all been there where people have done damaging things to us. Mm -hmm. And in our last lecture, we talked about how you get over that. You know, I thought I, I kind of was being a little bit facetious when I talked about sex. But sex is a big part of that. And being in an intimate space with another person. You know, when you're, with, when you're in that intimate space sex with another person. Sex doesn't always mean intimacy. Well, that's true. That's true. Sex doesn't always mean intimacy. As a matter of fact, it could be very destructive. It's like discursive <laughs> normalization. What did, what did you say, Anthony? He said it works for the time being. <laughs> <laughs> it's just momentary, though. It's moments I can't get back. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's a there's a, without intimacy, sex can be very, very empty, and sometimes yeah, meaningless, and also very, very stupid. It it's nasty, it's dirty, it's you know when it's when it, it when it's good. It doesn't matter how, how bad it is. It's it good. on what position you act in. Do you think we're getting a little bit too clinical yeah, here? Maybe. I think so. But the point is that intimacy intimacy takes on all sorts of things. You know, and, and so um, what I'm saying is that sometimes human beings, in order to uh, establish a certain understanding of themselves, need to be allowed to play certain roles. You know, like you can be Tarzan. And that's where it could be Jane, <laughs> you know, and you work out your, your master-slave fixations and fantasy in a safe environment. You know, so, so honey, I would be, I'll be Tarzan the next time, okay? <laughs> so, but if it's in that space, in that intimate space, you could play these games with each other and allow each other to understand the emotional breadth of those experiences. Mm -hmm. And that's why intimacy becomes very important because unless you have an intimate relationship with someone, sometimes you can't work through those things. And if you try to work out those things that, that, that are developmentally necessary, you can end up being very destructive for other human beings. You can annihilate other human beings. You can destroy other human beings. Therefore, it's important that you create that intimate, intimate space where people can function and learn about themselves. So discursion normalization allows people to go to certain places and see the connections. So again, we talked about what does discursive normalization look like. And the model that I like is that discursive normalization is when you when you begin naming things it's like exploring a house. You know, as you get into the house, you begin to walk through the house and you begin naming things. You don't know the role or the cultural implications of what you name. Well, this is a bedroom, okay. This is a kitchen, okay. Could I cook in a bedroom? No, you can't cook in a bedroom. It's absolutely okay. Can I make love in the kitchen? Well, sometimes if you if you're good enough. <laughs> you may be able to talk. But you realize that certain things culturally make sense and some things don't make any sense. Mm -hmm. And so over a period of time, as you explore that house, you begin to understand the cultural mm -hmm. roles, what you can, what you can do within that space. And so you begin to refine that space. And that space, you go from eric speech, which is kind of this wild name of everything, to idostic speech, where it has a cultural frame, and to eidetic speech, where you can begin to visualize and, and keep memories of that space where you have past memory of that space and current memories of that space. You realize from your past memory that, you know, it's not nice to make love in the, in the washroom. It's best in the bedroom. Mm. If you're sitting on the washroom dryer, actually, believe it or not, it's actually quite cool, believe it or not. With the machine on or off? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that's discursive normalization. Some Do people get to <laughs> some people get, people get to that space where they begin using 
this kind of wild exploration of their home in order to come up with some very bizarre concepts and ideas. And so, uh, and some of it makes sense, some of it doesn't make sense. And so when you, when you observe this guy, Donald Trump, think that this curse of nonsense comes up, he comes up constantly with these disruptive, nonsensical, non sequiturs, destructive comments just that comments doesn't lead any place. But it's, 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 but it's, it's good enough to, it's good enough to, to arouse the giants. You know, I mean, I love this fellow, Donald Trump. I can't stand him. Well, I love he's him. He's entertaining. He's, he's good for my program. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, because basically, you know, you know, <laughs> this is a fellow. This is a fellow who sent his son, Junior, to 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 Philadelphia, Mississippi. Why why would you send yourself to uh, Philadelphia, Mississippi, for the county fair? Well, the only thing that Philadelphia, Mississippi, is famous for using this is a report that uh, uh, Maddows, my favorite journalist, had on. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, that city is famous for the lynching and killing of civil rights workers. Reagan used it in 1980 when he was trying to send dog whistles to his, to, mm -hmm. to certain constituents within the, the alt-white rights wing. Mm -hmm. And so was Donald Trump. He was doing the same kind of thing, sending his son to that, 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 to that so part of town. And then, then, he, then he goes and he names the, the editorial chief of Breitbart, Bannon, to be one of his co-leads in his... Uh, Campaign again, sending signals to to uh, a certain segment of the alt-white uh, uh, population that you know I'm your we're guy. We're, we're racist. Wink and a nod. You know I, I got you, Bob. I got your back. You're gonna have to give me some room here. You know it's a kind of it's a kind of um, wink and a nod in order to allow him to be roasting. And people, you know, they're sitting around and they're thinking that this guy is trying to come up with some policy that makes sense. He, he's engaging in ethic speech. It's about emotions, about destructive, it's about power unto death, it's about nihilism, it's about those kind of destructive things. And and so you have to be, you know where it's coming from. It's about prosecutorial anxiety, using the prosecutorial anxiety of other people against them. You know, going to going to uh, Virginia, West Virginia, and telling you know we're going to bring back the coal industry. That is so. That is ridiculous. so ridiculous. The coal industry is not coming back. It's not competitive <laughs> enough. You have to completely rethink. The industry in that part of the world, and you need to. Uh, one of the interesting speeches that uh, Bill Clinton made was he said, I, I, "Hillary can't be to West Virginia to let those people know that you know we're not going to forget you guys. I know you're not voting for us, but we're not going to forget you guys because you're part of the American uh, beloved community. We want you to see, we want to see you do well." That was pretty. That was that was. You that think was he was a, sincere was, though? When well, Bill said that, because I mean, come well, on. Well, you know, the thing about it is you, you, you're you saying that he's engaging in discursive normalization. He probably is. He probably is, to a certain extent, trying to put a, put forward a great line. But, you know, if I'm going to date a, a woman, I want a woman who cooks and treats me nice <laughs> or thinks she's going she's gonna to care about me, as opposed to one who says, I don't really care about you. I'm not going to cook for you. I'm not going to care for you. You know, you want somebody who says, look, I'm going to think about you as I go forward because you're important to me. Because I love you. You're part of the beloved community. You're, you're, I'm going to be transcendent. I'm going to be moral. I'm going to be transcendent. I'm going to come up with routines and habits to make sure that you're safe, you're secure, that you have support within the beloved community. That's authentic. That's adding intimacy to that space. You know, when you're talking about deporting people and disrupting people's lives and doing very vicious things to them, that's not taking care of their their their, their anxiety, their prosecutorial mm -hmm. anxiety. Okay, mm -hmm. and so you you you, you supplant the prosecutorial anxiety with depressive anxiety. This is on previous lectures we talked about this program. This program. So aesthetic intimacy is very important. Aesthetic intimacy is huge. Um, aesthetic intimacy facilitates identity consolidation. And identity consolidation is how you manage anxiety, both prosecutorial and depressive anxiety. Relationships are where you manage anxiety. Okay? Relationships lead to intimacy and moral development. Relationships are key to generativity and transcendency. Transcendency, again, is that space where you begin to take care of the beloved community, where you 
begins by routine and habits, supporting other people's routines and habits, you begin to support safety, security, support, and service. Forget about what you think, forget about what you feel, it's what you do, it's what you say. Are you engaging in, 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 in an intimate conversation with another human being where you're acknowledging their vulnerabilities, their fears, and take, trying to take care of them? Okay? So again, transcendency supports the four S's, and asthesis, not being so preoccupied with yourself, is very, very much important to that process. So transcendency subserves, again, support, service, safety, and security. All of these things are needed for recovery from loss in the beloved community. It is not what you believe. It is about what you do. It is about being and becoming. Being and becoming. Being a better husband, being a better father, becoming a better person, becoming a more honest citizen. And basically, it's the only way of overcoming the, 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 the power and forces that we find in our speech. Discursive normalization can be very destructive. But discursive normalization, if it is influenced by a moral tracking system, <coughs> eventually leads to a place where you can create that intimate space. Discursive normalization can lead to agnostic speech which reflects cultural intimacy and it eventually can lead to eidetic speech where, where, where you, you, you begin to have intimacy and, and those intimate moments that are very important. Now, one of the things that you've got to remember about um, discursive normalization is that it is very helpful because what it does, it, it confirms biases. It can, it, when people talk, you listen to what people are talking about. You, you know, you tell them where they're at. So, for example, at one time in my life, if I were to sit down and I speak to you in a discursive way, I would say, yeah, man, I love bedrooms, man. I love all sorts of bedrooms. The bedroom set, water beds, <laughs> home beds, mattress on the ground, <laughs> hammocks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you would think that that's all I have on my mind. Beds. But beds. <laughs> no, you you know, but, nice. now, but now I'm thinking about, uh, well, you know, I don't want to have a Tuscan kitchen. Nice bar table, you know, where I can cook and entertain guests, you know. Yes. So it's more it's more pro social. It's yeah. not no longer the bedroom down in the kitchen where I'm entertaining guests and I have a big TV and I have food and more social. Kitchen, more, more social. Because my, my room, my home has not expanded up. What you know, it's not just about the bedroom anymore. But I understand that sometimes you have to have a nice Tuscan kitchen and tables in order to get to the bedroom. You have to use one <laughs> Transition, right? Transition. So you begin, as, as you mature, you begin to see the, the connection there. You transcend. But look, when you when when you when you're in the middle of a situation where you in, where you are being where you are where you're being minimized as a human being, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I look at that and I laugh because it's confirmation of bias. You know, when people in their speech talking about me. And they don't see me in as a full developed, evolved human being, but they see me only as a part object or whatever. They don't like you. And they, they don't like me or they, they're saying things about me that I don't recognize myself in. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing about it is that a lot of people experience that constantly, you know, where, where people just view them in very, you know, one-dimensional way, whether you're female or black or a young person. Mm -hmm. You know they can they can they can bring power onto death towards you, because they are they are aware of your prosecutorial stuff. They know what you're fearful of. You know to personalize it. One of the things that that I am afraid of is getting older. Mm -hmm. And I realize that in my life, uh, people have been very destructive using that fact against me. Mm -hmm. Nobody sits back and and try to help me no, because as I get older. They're trying to figure out how they can utilize that fact about me against me. Yeah. And that's prosecutorial anxiety. And so it tends to disrupt my routines when I want to have routines. You know, when I said, well, why don't you do this for me? Why don't you do that for me? But they can't do that. Because, and they know that nobody will do it for me. Because they know, oh, I don't have to do it for you. And so that is one of the things that, that, that you're aware of. How people utilize your your vulnerabilities against you. 
you know, if you're uh, if you're if you're if you're a novice or you're starting out to work, they want to pay you nothing. Yeah. You know, that Donald Trump, but you don't even deserve minimum wage. How do you want to wage seven fifty? <laughs> Have you ever tried living up seven fifty an hour? He's never lived in on New York that wage. City? You can't. It's starvation wages. You can't. Sometimes you have them living off of eggs and all kinds of stuff. You know, and so and so it, it when you when you, when you look at the beloved community, you know, you have to keep that in mind. And so that's part of that's part of the deal there. So transcendency, you know, in our in our in our in our um, Venn diagram, we talk about the importance of identity, <laughs> and that segues into moral development. Aesthetics, which is, which is about identity formation, moral development is consolidation of your moral spaces, your integrity, which then gives you a chance to go to a place of generativity, where you begin to take care of the of the of the um, of the beloved community. And and it doesn't really matter what you feel, as a lot of times we are as human beings we are very dis destroyed in so many ways. That's why that's why ascesis becomes important. You know, I've been in situations where people come into my space and they're utilizing things against me in a very destructive way, and I have to look at them and say, huh, I am going to make a decision to ignore that because I know that you are a mom and you're taking care of a child, and I'm going to give you information to help you take care of that child, despite the fact that you have been very destructive to me. Mm -hmm. But if I decide to get up on my high horses, and say, no, I'm not going to have a relationship with you because you're destructive towards me. Mm -hmm. You know, therefore, I cannot become, and in becoming a better doctor, it would be a handicap if I focus in on all the factors, all the negativity, all the negativity mm -hmm. that people have brought to my life. And, and this goes for every one of us. I'm no unique in this. You know, ascesis is what you need in order to give life to the beloved community. Not to be so preoccupied with yourself. Uh, to at times, you know, a lot of times my son comes and he sees me and I'm laying on the flat floor in my room. Or I'm not eating certain things. I can go in and I can eat flesh all day long. You know, meat, this, this, and I don't. Uh, because I realize that to be healthy, you know, you've got to make sure that you only eat so much. And if you're going to eat, you eat. And you, you become... You become Stoic, and you become a, 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 a curian, in the sense that you you celebrate that with friends. And when you in a situation that's outside of that, you tend to take care of yourself, and you tend to live a very frugal life, and you take on those responsibility not for the society, but you take it on for yourself. I will not eat as much. I will make sure I give ten percent to the poor. I will make sure that the people that I are in my space are safe. I will make sure that the police officer can go home to his family. I'll make sure that we don't violate that little black boy sitting in the park playing with a toy gun. That he needs a chance to explore those spaces in his life. And he shouldn't be shot within, within 90 seconds of, of rolling up on him. Because you can get away with it and you know you can get away with it. Because when we begin doing that, we, 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 we violate and we destroy the community. We destroy the sense of safety, safety in the beloved community. Mm -hmm. You know, and so that becomes very important. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I will want to explore more of this in the next lecture, but I think that that was our uh, uh, our last slide. Uh, so, any questions? No. We had talked about it before about the discursive nominalism and how it how we see it in our politics today. You know, with Donald Trump being a prime example, and then you said something else. You said that it shows your bias, and he has shown his bias to blacks, Mexicans, um, mm -hmm. I don't think necessarily gays. Muslims. Isn't it? Yeah, Muslims. 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 It's primarily Muslims, blacks, and Mexicans. You know, and um, and he's a rabble rouser. He's a rabble rouser. And the thing that I note that I keep hearing discursive nominalism, and when he was talking, if you watch him talk, he says absolutely nothing. He goes on and he spoke for a long period of time. And the only thing I could get out of it was 
nothing. But there are people in the audience cheering. And I want to know who these people are. But then you saw at some of the rallies, they were racist because they were saying nigger. They were saying other things. They were telling the, the beaners go home. They, they were very nasty. You know, and that's who his people are that, that go to his rallies and support him. And who, why would I take the time? I wouldn't even take the time to have a discussion with a person that was at his rally or even with him because they're so nasty that it's, it, when, when people are nasty, they do cause you harm you don't because believe? their negativity causes you harm. So you and don't, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't have a, a sense of sharing the beloved community with Donald Trump? I don't. He is not a part of my community. He's not a part of my community. And the community that he is part of is not part of your community either. Or yours, or yours. No. He, he's not part of our community. I don't know so what community how, how he's you, a part of. You see him being, uh, how would you, how would you be a part of He they can't relate to anybody. He can't. he can't relate to anybody. I, 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 I it and bothers my mind that my husband sits there and watches him for hours. Because after I've been exposed to him for about 15 minutes, I feel I'm sick to my stomach. Him. He, makes me, <laughs> he makes me feel physically sick. When I look at him and what he's saying, and this, this thing going on, you know, <laughs> and this point, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to fix everything, and I'm the only one that can fix everything. And he's very absor abs uh, uh, absorbed with himself. Very absorbed with himself. He, he thinks he's the be it and end all, that he can fix all woes. He's not saying as a country we will fix these problems. He's saying I can fix everything. I, and he's just totally self-absorbed. Self-absorbed, negative, all the things that, that you mentioned. I don't know what kind of loss he's recovering from, but whatever it is, he's not dealing well with it. Well, you know, this is a man who has, uh, reportedly, he has a golden plated bath. Room yes. So what, what kind of loss could he possibly have? Oh, yeah, in have? his hotel, too. What kind of loss can he possibly have? What's making him so nasty and bitter? Because in the future, he's going to have to give all of that up, man. He's going to die one of these days. I don't think he wants to age either. You can tell he's that's why he that keeps changing. That's why he keeps changing the women and getting a newer version and a newer version and a newer version. But there, I don't know why he is such a hateful person. You feel he's hateful? He's a hateful man who who knows how to, to get around. If I don't if he know. wasn't wealthy, he'd be a sociopath. I don't. He I, would be a killer. Why could you, he, you, you, why sound, could... you sound you think that's funny, but if he wasn't wealthy. He's the kind of man who would be a sociopath. I actually don't he think that... And he is. But he doesn't he, care. He doesn't have any regret. What are the qualities of a sociopath? No, I hear what you're saying. I'm just... I don't really think that he's hateful. He's... I, I, believe, I, believe he's a, <laughs> I believe he's a bigot, but I don't think he's hateful. What do you mean you don't think he's hateful? I just think he's ignorant. No, he's not ignorant. If... He's, it would that would that would be, be to assume that would be, I don't believe he's like that would be hateful. to assume that this man of the world doesn't know what he's saying. No, he. But he you know what? When you I look, at, let me finish this. Now and be quiet. <laughs> when you look at his old interviews, when he spoke sensibly, this is a man who used to be for the Clintons. This yeah. is a man who said, who who, who has has said very politically astute things and was politically correct at what time. But at this point in time, he is purposefully igniting a fire underneath the racist. No, I agree with everything that And he's saying. very aware of what he's doing. It's a, it's a, 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 a perfect effort to do so. But like you said, it also shows where he is. You think maybe it's just an it's experiment that he's running? Maybe I'm thinking he, that he, I think that he's having the time of his life. Yeah, he's getting you say all whatever you want to say. He's getting attention. He just it's like he, a social he, experiment. It's like he doesn't even care. 
So he'll just say whatever he wants to say. doesn't care whether he wins or not. He doesn't care. You know, one of the things I find so fascinating about America, and one of the reasons I love America so much, is that we can have this discussion. <laughs> we can have this discussion. We just, we just, we just nominated, uh, or we just elected a black, the black president, who is he's clearly the best candidate best running. Candidate and this guy has been elegant beyond belief. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. He's been a wonderful president. And you know. The one good thing about America is that it gives you choices. And gives you choices. Given a choice. And and you know, we even have the choice to say that God doesn't exist. You know, which is not what I believe in. I believe God exists very much so. I know he exists. And um, he's part of my life and I and I feel him on a daily basis. God is always a presence in my life since I was a kid. So you know, I can talk to other people and they just don't see this and they don't get this. And you know, I don't try to convince them of that necessarily. What I do do is try to be intimate and kind to them, so that I share with them what my beliefs are. You know, and one of the one of the one of the tricks that I learned as a psychiatrist is that the easiest thing you can give to another human being is respect, mm -hmm. and intimacy, and care. Respecting their beliefs. Mm -hmm. In respect, intimacy, and care, because when you do that, they give you information that you can help them. I, when I speak to my clients, when I speak to my patients, um, even those who sometimes disrespect me, you know, um, it's by having them reflect on what it is that they're saying, what it is that they're doing, but also to make sure that I give them a certain level of respect. Because every human being, they, people thrive on respect. And when you see it in real time, it is a wonderful thing to see. You know, um, Waldo Emerson, can we get up that quote again? I love it. Uh, if I, I yeah, I, I loved it as notes. well. I, Ralph Waldo Emerson. I, I just absolutely love that quote. There you go. This one? Um, yeah. Um, basically, um, Ralph Waldo Emerson talking about the beloved community and the importance of routines and habits, and the importance of us giving each other agency to play the roles that we need to play as a mother, as a father, as a, as, as a sister, as a brother. It says that man is a bundle of relationships. We have intimate relationship with each other. I'm just paraphrasing at this point. A knot of roots, whose flowers and fruits is the world. Whose flowers and fruits is the world. The community. Mm -hmm. It's the community. Yeah. And, um, you know, one of the things that I, one of the other books that I'm, I'm looking at is a book by uh, Charles Taylor, and it's called The Language Animal, and it is a wonderful book. And these books tend to talk about the same thing. That's the wonderful thing. You know, so I've been doing this nonsense since I was 16 years, or walking across Brooklyn Bridge to the Fifth Avenue Central mm -hmm. Library, sitting there and reading, trying to understand Nietzsche and Hobbes and these folks. And as my brother said, you know, these are now your companions and your friends. I said, yeah, that's true. Because they have allowed me to live a very uh, uh, transcendent life. Um, one of the things that uh, Charles Taylor did in Exploring Language, you know, as human beings, we, we are unique because we have what? No, language. Know. Language. And our language can change. You know, and one of the, well, I'm just beginning this book uh, by Charles Taylor. What he says is that, you know, he talks of, 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 uh, of uh, the two functions of language. One is in framing, mm -hmm. meaning that it's, it reflects our empirical experiences in real time. Mm -hmm. It has to reflect that. Mm -hmm. It has to reflect uh, our, our empirical understanding of what's happening in real time in the world. But one of the most powerful statements that he's made was that, there's also a constitutive part of language, which is what the German romantics would talk about, the importance of language, mm -hmm. in terms of giving you a sense of the intricacy and the, and, the, and the absolute joy and wonders of life. I was sitting in my car listening to a piece of music by John Denver, any song. Senses, like an <laughs> the old forest. Man, I, I, I don't know of another, I, 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 there's no more beautiful love song, love ballad than that, that I've heard in a while. You know, and, and that's an example Baby of... Baby Got Back? Baby Got Back is one... That's a great one. <laughs> <laughs> that 
Oh, I good. love it. I love that it, man. Good. Hey, give him five for me. <laughs> Baby got back. I love that song too, <laughs> man. <laughs> Baby got back. I love it. But no, no, no. Yeah. This is wonderful stuff. I mean, that's part of the culture. That's the wonderful thing about yeah. the culture is that we share that space with each other, and we laugh at stuff, and we understand what it's about, and we can share that space with each other. You know, like I, every now and then I sit down in my car. You know, for example, I was in my car driving, and I, I begin listening to this wonderful. Uh, a piece by 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 Miles Davis uh, on, on Midnight uh, uh, Night in Tunisia, Night in Tunisia. Oh my God, what a piece of music! It's so youthful and so elegant. Yeah, I can't think of anything more elegant and, and fabulous than a Night in Tunisia. You know, as a piece of music. You know, and then and then you you you, you understand the importance of art. You look at, uh, of course, I you talk about Macbeth. You talk about uh, a guy like Tupac Shakur and his "When We Ride" and reflecting his experiences. So culture, culture becomes very important, and and uh, Magdosha talks about the importance of uh, culture what's up? and, and uh, ethno no. poetry. In, in, I can in, mute it in, via uh, this in, way. In, in, in enriching the language and how we live our lives. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there was a famous quote by a uh, very famous quote by uh, one of uh, the governors of New York State, uh, Cuomo, Governor Cuomo, and he says, you know. I, I conduct my elections, I run for office using poetry by governing prose. I hope I got that right. Mm -hmm. But it's the idea that poetry transforms human beings and gets us into a space where we can think about very complex issues in ways that, that sometimes we can't do when we're just engaging in, in routine kind of speech. So language is very important. And when I talk about uh, uh, discursive normalization, is that in discursive normalization, then you're going to get away with it, get, or get away from it. It will be there, but you have to be aware of the process, that it's, a, it's language that can be very destructive, very alienating, and the only way you keep it from being those things is by imbuing it with a sense of intimacy. And intimacy gives you a chance to back off from things and give you to a, get you to a space where you can be kind, where you can, where you can begin to reflect the moral sentiment and do justice to other people. Anyway, the next lecture is going to be on, um, on the 14th of September. And again, boy, this is, I'm getting much more ambitious. These things are getting bigger <laughs> simply because we're trying to put a book together, guys. Okay. It's good we, to have we, passion. We talk about that. <laughs> Yeah. We talk about that. we talk about asceticism, and I begin to look at some of the historical implications of this work. Uh, specifically, we talked about um, we talk about Napoleon and and uh, and Lycurgus. Lycurgus is the guy who actually created the military state uh, of Sparta. And uh, we talk of a guy like uh, this is this is looking at uh, at, at Hegel's historicism and the importance of, of, of historical figures. Now, I once wrote a, a, a little blog on, uh, on uh, Donald Trump. I said Donald Trump probably could become president if he focused on one thing. National security? No, if he focused on the economy. Mm. No. Oh, okay. If he focused on the economy. Mm. All of his vulgarities and stupidities oh, here and there. Yeah. If he says, I'm going to but build a bank. And he I'm focused only on that. Why would I want him running my like Well, but you know, but you see the thing is he's not a very smart man. That's the problem with Donald Trump. Because basically, you know, um, for example, look look at the idea of the uh, TPP, Trans Pacific Partnership. Mm -hmm. Now that is one of those very important uh, public policy discussions that this country needs to have. But we aren't having a good discussion about that. Because everybody is trying to go to polar opposites. I don't understand that. Whether we like it or not, the agents are going to create the marketplace. And for our business to do well in that growing market, we have to have access to that market. Mm -hmm. TPP allows us to have access to that market. The problem is that the Republicans have systematically taken away the power of, of, the, of the labor movement in this country mm -hmm. by destroying their unions. Mm -hmm. And so... If you do that, you can't have a conversation with the, those people. You can't have a conversation with, with, with the vulture capitalists who would take a plant in Ohio, Ohio and move to China 
displacing all of those American workers where the only jobs you have now is to go work for Walmart for minimum wage or, or the ladies if they're good looking enough right. they can go do some line dancing or pole dancing yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know that's that's our choices you look at the great city of Detroit beautiful Detroit. city mm -hmm. but it was systematically destroyed. It's open for everyone. You know, and it's what Hegel would talk of as, 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 uh, as, as creative destruction. But the only way you, you, you go against creative destruction is by understanding that the beloved community has to survive. And you have to take care of every element in the beloved community, right? Yes. All right, so that is our lecture. So on the 14th, we're going to have another streaming video. Hopefully, we can work with some of these technical bugs. But yep. it's going to be we're going to be looking at um, uh, we're going to be looking at at a thesis, uh, sacrificing self in order to take care of the community. The question: Who owns it? Is a thesis owned by by the by the state or is it owned by the individual? I make the point that when it's owned by the individual, um, you have a much better outcome. If it owned, it's, it's owned by the state or the culture, you have Sparta, which, you know, Sparta is a great military society, but it died because it, 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 it victimized too many people mm -hmm. within its uh, uh, borders. Thank you. Okay.